Здравствуйте, товарищи. Welcome back to Russian Through Propaganda. We're on day 61. And uh, in this chapter, we're going to cover the genitive plural. That's going to be a major topic uh, here. But before we get to that, let's introduce some new vocab today and just some uh, various topics. Uh, for example, talking about clothes and also colors and a little bit about uh, sizes. So uh, our first poster today is galoshi, right? Advertising galoshes. Now, our first thing to discuss is uh, plural only nouns, right? So galoshes obviously are a noun you'd normally hear in the plural, uh, like any, you know, shoes or anything else that comes in pairs usually. And uh, so, you know, usually you'll get galoshi. But uh, of course, if you only had one galosh, then you could use that in the singular in, in Russian as in English, right? So uh, the singular of galoshi is galosha. Uh, so let's look at a, a bit at some uh, some clothing items that normally uh, come in pairs, and so therefore are almost always heard in the plural. Right? For example, где мои носки? Where are my socks? Right? So носки, that's just a nominative plural, like we learned uh, last chapter. Вот один носок, а где другой? Okay, now we're singling out uh, one sock, right? Here's one sock, один носок. And there we see that the the nominative singular of this is masculine, right? One problem with these nouns that can make them a bit tricky is since you're always hearing them or almost always hearing them in the plural, it's easy to forget what is what the singular form would be, right? What gender you're dealing with, right? You look at nice you don't really know, is it? Although you can sort of guess, but I don't want to get into all that, right? Uh, anyway, the uh, the the singular is nasuk; it's masculine. Uh, another example: Shuti kupila adur rubashku adni jeansi. Right? What did you buy? I bought one shirt. Adur rubashku. That's feminine accusative. E adni jeansi. Here's a somewhat peculiar little item. Right? We learned that adin uh, is a basically a special modifier. Right? The number one modifies a noun and it changes its endings uh, to agree with the noun it modifies, right? So you have idin, computer, radna, kniga, and so forth. And there is this somewhat weird uh, plural form, idni, which may at least strike English speakers as strange. Uh, and uh, so uh, basically that's used to refer to items that are that are um, normally plural in Russian or plural only, like jinsi, right? Uh, so idni jinsi means... Uh, well, as we would say in English, one pair of genes, right? One genes, so to speak, and that whole construction is plural. Okay, let's look over a few items of clothing and, and whatnot that are plural only. And these, we could say, are pretty much never used in the singular, at least not in this meaning, right? So, stanli, uh, and then that's, of course, the nominative plural, and then uh, normally a dictionary would give the Genitive plural, so this is a bit of a preview of tomorrow's grammar, right? Shtanof is the genitive plural of shtanli, and that's telling us that off ending is showing us that this is actually a hard masculine noun. Uh, bruki means pants. Bruk, right, is the plural, right? That's a zero ending uh, genitive plural, uh, which is uh, typical of hard uh, feminines and neuters. Achki, glasses, uh, literally means uh, little eyes in Russian. We saw the other day that ochi uh, is a kind of a poetic, more archaic form of the modern Russian glaza, meaning eyes. And so achki, from achok, uh, which again is a word you never really hear, right? It's always in the plural achki, and then the uh, genitive plural achkov. Duhi means perfume. So there's one that may strike... English speakers as strange. And keep in mind, by the way, that these, these this issue of plural only, and as we'll talk about later, singular only nouns uh, may not line up from one language to another, right? So we say it, it sounds strange for us to, to see that duhi in Russian perfume is always plural, even if you're talking just about perfume or one perfume or whatever. By the way, that word duh in the singular means uh, spirit, it also has to do with breath and, in this case, I guess, smell or kind of a, you know, some some stream of uh, gas or whatever, fumes, right? That kind of idea. So anyway, the, that gives duhi, the modern Russian for perfume. The genitive is duhov. Here's a very common one, chisli. We see that that's the plural of chas, so it means lit literally hours, uh, but its normal meaning is a clock or a watch, right? So chisli, chisof. And again, that can mean one clock or multiple clocks. Uh, jeansli, jeans, of course. 
that this happens sometimes. Another kind of thing that may make uh, English speakers giggle a bit, right? Of course, genes in English is plural, uh, and so but Re- Russian took that form genes, and then in turn gave it a Russian plural ending. So what they end up with is something like geneses or something if you sort of translate it literally, right? Genesly, and then the genitive plural genesif. Another example like that is uh, chipsly, right? Like chips, potato chips, right? Chips in the plural in English, and then it ends up chipsly in Russian. Okay, so more pretty expect- to be expected, I guess. Shorty means shorts, plural. Nozhnitsly, scissors, right? They come in a pair. I don't know. You know, you wouldn't normally say I have one scissor, right? It's always scissors. Okay, here's one you definitely want to circle. Uh, Dengi means money, and you see that's plural only in Russian. The reason for that is that uh, this this word, it, its its original singular was dinga, I believe, dinga, which basically meant coin. And so, uh, as happens in a lot of languages, you end up with a, a plural term for money because it originally meant coins, basically. Right, so at any rate, uh, yingi is is always plural. It's plural only in modern Russian, and the genitive plural would be dienik. So, for example, uh, if you wanted to say I have a lot of money, umenya mnoga dienik, right? A lot of monies, so to speak, in that plural form. Finally, another one that strikes us English speakers as maybe a bit unexpected, slivki uh, means cream, and uh, again, plural only. So slivki, slivok. So, by the way, to preview the instrumental plural, you can have your coffee saslivkami, with cream. Or again, you may think of it as with creams. It's a plural form in, in uh, Russian. Or uh, bez slivak, right, without uh, cream. Okay, so let's uh, take a few nouns that uh, are usually seen in the plural, but not necessarily, right? So a lot of these come in pairs. Right, and let's just practice, uh, well, review the nominative plural by giving the plurals for these. Volus, right, the plural would be, in Russian, something more like hairs, right, again, plural uh, there, usually volusy, volusy. So if you say, you know, I don't know, he has nice hair, she has nice hair, whatever, you would talk about volusy in the plural. Now, sok, as we saw, a sok, plural would be nice ski, right, a uh, Mobile vowel there. Naski, sapok, plural boots, sapagi. That's an in stress masculine, sapagi. Uh, a batinik is something more like a, a shoe that resembles more a boot than some type of a dress shoe. Uh, so a singular, the singular would be batinik, plural batinki. Again, the mobile vowel. Okay, the next item is an important one, right? Uh, slippers. These are the house slippers that Russians normally put on when they come in, when they enter an apartment, right? They take off their street shoes and put on a uh, top key. And uh, they'll usually have several spare uh, pairs of slippers to give to guests. So always be sure and do that when you enter a Russian home. That's a pretty strict uh, uh, rule there. And uh, P.S., don't walk around in socks. That's just weird, right? Russians typically just don't do that. Uh, and they'll tend to think it's a little bit odd. Um Again, I'm stereotyping a little bit, but again, generally speaking, that's just not done. You wear top key in the house, especially if you're someone's guest. Okay, so anyway, the uh, singular is topka, plural top key, and uh, a diminutive form you hear a lot. Topich, topichka would be the singular, topichki would be the plural. And as with so many things in Russian, you know, you you hear the the diminutive forms all the time, right? Almost more often than the the ordinary forms, just in everyday speech. Okay, uh, so a shoe that's a bit more dressy would be a tuflia, plural tufli, right? Uh, feminine soft, so we write e there. Krasovka is more like a tennis shoe or an athletic shoe. The plural would be krasovki. Uh, genitive plural, by the way, would be krasovak, right? So we'll talk about that more tomorrow. And finally, an earring is a sirga. Plural would be Siergi, and there's that expected uh, stress jump backwards, right, that we talked about last chapter. Here's a great Russian proverb, uh, literally, someone else's soul, darkness. Patyomki is kind of a peculiar uh, Russian noun. Uh, uh, 
it's it's also plural only, right? So Pachomki means darkness, uh, but again, grammatically, it's plural in Russian. By the way, there are other words for darkness, like chma uh, and chimnata that are singular. Okay, so Pachomki is kind of a weird old uh, word, but this Paslovitz uh, basically means that you can't ultimately know another person, right? You can never know what's really in their heart of hearts. And, uh, you know, that phrase comes up a lot in Russian literature, and uh, a lot we could say about that, you know, just in terms of Russian literature and Russian thought and whatnot. But anyway, uh, it's just a folk saying. Okay, let's talk about colors quickly. And this is an easy topic grammatically. These are basically just adjectives, right? And we could describe anything as being, for example, black, right? A black computer, a black telephone, a black book, or whatever. We would just make the adjective black agree with whatever we're modifying. Uh, for example, what about uh, Malievich, the painter Malievich's famous, uh, scandalous, notorious, infamous work of art, right, called the Chorny Quadrat, the Black Square. Uh, maybe you've heard of this. If you haven't, you definitely you should definitely be on your radar. Uh, right, so uh, anyway, Chorny Quadrat, Black Square, Quadrat is masculine, and so you see Chorny, right, the uh, masculine adjectival form. Okay, let's read through, uh, just read through these items here. They're in the masculine, of course, by default. Um, and by the way, it may be worth reviewing if, you, if you've forgotten, why do we give the masculine? It may seem kind of sexist. The only reason really in Russian is because it's convenient because the masculine forms tend to show um, what we need to know about an adjective. The most obvious example being, is it an interest adjective like boy or zelatoy? right here looking over these masculine forms, right? Because if, if we were only fed the the um, feminine and the stress weren't marked as normally it wouldn't be, then, you know, it would be somewhat more ambiguous. So if, anyway, for whatever reason, uh, the masculines are usually given by default because it's easy to get the feminines and neuters from the masculines. Okay, anyway, Chorny, Bieli, Krasny, Zilioni, Jolty, Aranjevi, Rosavi, Globoy, Sini. Okay, there's something that may surprise you, right? Russians have two very distinct words for blue. And, uh, you know, speaking of a topic we could say a lot about, uh, it may never have occurred to you that this, this issue of colors, right? What, what colors exist on the spectrum, right? Of course, the spectrum is a rather fluid thing, right? But uh, we, in any given language, we tend to single out certain shades of the spectrum and give them a name, right? And we tend to just think that that's the most obvious thing in the world, right? But if uh, this is a huge topic, if you're interested in it, you could look it up. In fact, I was I was listening to a um, podcast the other day, which I'd recommend, but it's in Swedish, right? It's uh, it's one of these one great reason to learn um, Scandinavian languages. By the way, if you're kind of a language person, is uh, their public radio broadcast and podcast these days, right? They're really, really good, and there are tons of them. But anyway, I was listening to one on philosophy, and they were talking about this this issue of what colors exist, how we perceive colors, and how we name them. And they were, speaking of blue, by the way, they were saying that um, it seems that in most world languages, the, the, the word for the color blue, right, just the idea that there is a color blue was the last to emerge historically, which may strike us as utterly bizarre, and they were saying, for example, that in ancient Greece and in a lot of, uh, you know, earlier stages of, of, of cultures around the world, right, people tended to think of colors more in terms of light and dark and maybe as the, the colors of different things, like the color of wine or whatever, and not necessarily, you know, red as we would think of it today. Okay, so anyway, I don't know a whole lot about that. I just kind of casually. But uh, uh, anyway, what's the difference here in Russian, right? Uh, Goluboy is basically a... Uh, light blue. Um, in English, at least in the U.S., we would usually call this something like baby blue or maybe sky blue. But here's where it gets strange. When Russians talk about the blue sky, they usually use the second adjective, sini, which generally is a deeper, kind of richer, darker blue. Um, but you see that with this example of the sky that the, this distinction between goloboy and sini may not be obvious. Um, you know, there are other examples. I can think of, for example, in Hungarian, there are two different words for red, pyrrhos and vorosh. And it's kind of an open issue. I mean, well, native speakers know, of course, what, what 
you know, what is what is Pirush and what is Vorush, but as a language learner, it's not exactly obvious. Okay, so kind of something interesting to if you have Russian friends, you may point at something and say, "Hey, is this Sini or Goloboy or whatever?" and see if it kind of surprises you. Uh, but again, I, I think the best, the safest bet for uh, English speakers is that that Goloboy is more of what we might call baby blue. You know, another great idea, uh, great example if you're a football fan is uh, Petersburg's team, the beloved team Zenit. Their two colors are basically Goloboy and Sini, meaning they have a, a light blue, kind of a sky blue, and then a deeper, richer blue. Um, it's one final note. That, you know, people often say Sini means dark blue. It's really something, it could be, I guess, but it's really something more like just the blue, like the primary color blue. It's like a pure uh, blue uh you know, I guess what we would think of in English as as blue by default, as opposed to sky blue or baby blue or something. Okay, but enough on that. Note, by the way, that seeing ye is a soft adjective. Okay, uh, next one: коричневый, brown, серый, gray, fialetový, fialetový, purple, or you may think of that as violet. Or you see, it's it's cognate with violet, fialetový, uh, beigevý. Beige is a latoy, golden or gold colored. Okay, uh, so to ask uh, what color is something, we get a slightly trickier construction. We use the genitive to say, Kakovat sviata tvoya rubashka, literally, of what color is your shirt? And if we were answering that qu question directly, we would model the grammar in the original question. We would say, Krasnova, as in Krasnova sviata. Or, of course, we could switch gears a little bit and say ana krasnaya or something, right? Umina krasne rubashka or something. In which case we're just simply modifying rubashka and so we need the feminine form of the um, adjective. But you get this uh, we'll see other examples later talking about qualities of certain things. You say you use a genitive and say again in this case of what color is it? Uh, by the way, if you do want to specify with the other colors d bright versus dark, red for example, you say you kind of make a compound adjective with yarka, which means bright or vivid, and tsyomna, uh, which is from tsyomni, uh, meaning dark. So, for example, a bright green would be yarka zilioni, and a dark green would be tsyomna, oh, sorry, dark red we have in the book, tsyomna krasni. Okay, so uh, again, generally, there's not a whole lot to discuss here. You could read through here and just answer some questions, practice using these uh Adjectives. I'll just read out the uh, questions. Kakayo tibia rubashka, right? What kind of shirt do you have? And again, the easiest way to, of course, by the way, that question isn't asking specifically about color. It's just asking to, you to describe the shirt. And among other things, you could you could describe its color, right? Umunya krasna rubashka, for example. Starya krasna rubashka, right? An old red shirt. Kakio tibia bruki, right? Plural. Kakoyo tibia rukzak. Какая у тебя футболка? It's a t-shirt. А какие у тебя кроссовки? Plural, right? Какие у тебя носки? What are your socks like, right? Again, plural. Какое у тебя пальто? Neuter. Какой у тебя учебник? Right? Какая у тебя куртка? Какая у тебя сумка или кошелек? All right, so now, again, if we wanted to be very specific and ask about something's color, we would use this Kakovat Sveta. Kakovat Sveta Tvoya Mashina. And again, if we were answering that question very directly, we would say, for example, Chornova, uh, uh, meaning of black color, right? Svet, the word for color, is uh, masculine. Right? Kakovat Sveta Tvoya Rubashka, of what color is your shirt? Kakovat Sveta Tvoya Rukzak. And we could say again, karichnivava or something, right? It is it is of brown color. Okay, so you get the picture. Uh, speaking of colors, right, this is one vocab item that always confuses people. The word for color, as we just saw, is tsviet, tsviet. And the plural of that, meaning colors, is tsvieta. So the word color is one of these masculine nouns you may remember from last chapter that take a stressed ah in the nominative, nominative plural, right? And that's not predictable, right? So tsviet just happens to be one of those nouns. Tsvieta means colors. Now, the word people confuse that with is the word for flowers. Flowers, usually in the plural, 
that's tsvyty, tsvyty, right? So this term for flowers shows the kind of ordinary uh, masculine plural ending in the nominative. One flower would be a tsvytok, tsvytok, which is actually a diminutive, right? That ok ending uh, quite often, that little suffix is a diminutive suffix for masculine nouns. So I guess it would mean literally something like little flower, meaning it's just one one little flower as opposed to a bunch of flowers. Okay, so at any rate, there's a you might want to take note of that. It's kind of confusing. Um, by the way, if you're giving flowers in Russia, and Russians give lots of flowers. They love to give flowers. You can buy flowers all over the place, and uh, it's something nice to do. Uh, anyway, but if you do buy flowers, uh, don't buy an even number of flowers. So this is a cultural thing, right? We're, don't buy your uh, your special someone a dozen roses because that's uh, for funerals, right? So giving odd numbers is kind of bad luck if you give them to someone who's still alive, right? So for example, get 11 roses, get 13 or whatever. Get or, Of course, th some people think 13 is an unlucky number. It's my lucky number, by the way. But anyway, yeah, give 11 roses. Let's put it that way. Or, you know, give give three, give five. But uh, for God's sake, don't give an even number of flowers. Okay, let's uh, talk about size and weight. So again, these are just really more, just more vocab today that we're going to be using in this chapter. Um, let's look at some adjectives to describe, again, size and weight. Dminli, karotki, shiroki, uski, vysoki, Niski, sredni, soft adjective, right? Did you spot it? Prastorny, gluboki, tolsty. And that can mean fat and also just thick, like a thick novel or something. Tonki, which means thin. By the way, that can also mean kind of something like subtle or delicate. Uh, Tijoli, heavy. Lyorki means light, like it doesn't weigh much, or also easy, can mean both things. Yarki or svietli. Um, svietli means literally just bright, like full of light, which is sviet. Yarki means something a little bit more like vivid, like kind of brightly colored, for example. Dark is tiomni. Uh, tight or cramped is uh, tiesni. And then some nouns, uh, rost means height, age is vozrest, size is razmier. Okay, so, uh, you know, with a lot of these nouns here, again, we can use genitive expressions. Like, for example, let's say you're pointing at a pair of pants or whatever, and you want to say, what size are they? You would say, kakov razmiera, right? Of what size? Of what size is this or that? This or that? Right, so uh, anyway, vies is weight, dlina, shirina, glubina, tolshina, right? A little bit more specific, kind of technical sounding terms, right? Length, width, depth, and thickness, feminine nouns there. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I try to just maybe describe some of your things using some of these words, like kakio tibia okna, shiroki i visoki ili uski i marinki, right? Wide and tall or narrow and small, what kind of room do you have? Is it bright or dark? Now, of course, you could say and that would actually probably, probably be uh, more appropriate here if you just mean that it's full of light, right? Is it spacious or tight, cramped? Right? Uh, there's a word that wasn't here in this list. Udobne just means comfortable. And then as with so many Russian nouns, you can just negate that by adding a nye in front, right? So udobny means comfortable, neudobny, uncomfortable. Kakoi tibia rugzak. What about your backpack? Tijoli ili lyohki. Right, heavy or light? Shiroki ili uski. Is it uh, wide or narrow? On tibia nravitsa. Remember that construction, right? Is it pleasing to you? Does it? Do you like it? I claim the Ruziam. Do your friends like it? Is it pleasing to your friends? Okay, so here, you know, we could talk more about this. Uh, I don't want to uh, do too much here, but let's talk about some ways to describe physical features quickly. So, uh, using some of these nouns we just learned, rost means height. It literally means something like growth, right? Like how, how tall something's, something has grown. Uh, so, for example, we could say rost putina. 
170 centimeters. Right? Russians usually give height in, uh, well, of course, they're using meters, centimeters, and whatnot, so giving it here in centimeters. And again, you could say, if you want to say someone's tall, you can say on vysoki, uh, but kind of the, the more full way to say that would be on vysokova rosta. He is of tall height, or srednyova or nebarshova rosta. Right, uh, so he, he's of not great height, meaning short. Right, so that's the best way to do that usually. Um, anyway, uh, the, the main reason for that being that you, people don't, there isn't really a Russian word for short. Niski means that, but it's not usually used of people, right? You say instead, on Nibashova Rosta or Marinkova Rosta or something, uh, instead of saying Niski. Uh, Niski, by the way, can also mean kind of base in kind of a moral sense, right? So it, it almost sounds, it sounds very denigrating to say that someone is Niski, right? It may, it may not, it doesn't really uh, immediately bring to mind height, uh, but rather their moral qualities. Okay, anyway, what about uh, weight, vies? Okay, you can use a verb, uh, viesit, which means to weigh, uh, um, or, so for example, or you can use this noun, right? Vies Putina 77 kilogram, right? 77 kilograms. Or then you could say, I weigh, or he weighs, or whatever, and then just give the amount. Ya viesu, or on viesit 90 kilogram. There you have it. Okay, what about eye color and hair color? Okay, here we can just use um, plural adjectives. Glaza is, right, uh, plural. Volosy, also plural. So you can say glaza mnya golubuya karya. By the way, karya is that one bizarre soft adjective whose stem doesn't end in n, right? That's the only example I know of, uh, and so very odd. But there it is: karya, chornya, sierya, zelionya. Okay, what about volosy? Volosy mnya chornya, tiomnya, svetlya, rusya, which is more like a dark blonde, right? Svetly. Svetly of Volosy usually calls to mind like a very, very bright blonde. Rusly is somewhat of a you know darker shade of blonde. And finally, Svetlya, that's a special word. We saw earlier that the, the general word for the color gray is Svetly. Svetly refers to gray hair, like, you know, old people's hair, right? Uh, so you say Svetly of Volosy, not Svetly of Volosy. Okay, let's look quickly at um, some voc some verbs here. For We're talking about clothing, right? How do we put on clothes and so forth? Well, here's some, uh, actually a really useful example if you need to review reflexive particles. Um, the, the basic verb here for all of these is uh, a verb you don't see too often. Uh, the verb is divat diet. And uh, I think I've talked about this before in another video. That's a verb I, I don't believe I've ever seen it in a Russian textbook. And yet it's it, it, in this unprefixed form, divat diet, but it's actually used quite often by Russians, right? So it basically means to put something somewhere, often in a way where like it, it got lost or, or something like this, like, kuda ya diel right? Where did I put my glasses? Where did, where did my glasses get off to or something like this? So again, that basic verb is divat diet, and diet is an in obstruent, meaning dienu, dienish, dienit, etc. is the way that's conjugated. So that verb is, is heard sometime in its, sometimes in its unprefixed form, but it's also heard a lot in various prefixed forms, right? All, all of which have to do with, for example, putting on clothing, right? So the basic verb means to put, and then you can put clothing on. You can, uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's the basic verb we're dealing with here. Okay, so let's start out with one form that's quite simple. To put on an item of clothing is nadivat nadiet. And again, that means quite literally to put onto, to put on. Right, and there you see the forms. Nadivait, uh, by the way, that's a derived imperfective. Nadivaya, nadivayish. As usual, it's very easy to conjugate. And then the perfective is a bit more tricky. An in obstruent, nadienu, nadienish, nadienit, etc. Okay, so that means to put something on, like ya nadiel swayu shapku, I put on my hat or whatever. Uh, okay, now let's look at a few others. And uh, here's again an interesting example with the Reflexive particle. Adivata diet, the o here meaning something like around or kind of the idea of coverage, right? You're you're getting dressed basically. 
But a divaita diet without the particle is transitive, as we would normally expect, meaning a divaita diet means to dress someone, like a kid or something, right? I dressed the kid, right? A divaita diet. Now, what if you dress yourself or what if you're talking about the kid getting dressed, right? He is being dressed passive, right, by his mother or whatever. Well, that's adjivatsa adjietsa, right? So there's that use of the, of the reflexive particle. And again, depending on the context, that could mean reflexive, I dress myself, or passive, I am getting dressed. Right now, again, the conjugation is the same. We have here what we could call a little family of verbs, meaning they're all built off the same basic verb. They just have different prefixes. Um Okay, what about the second one? To undress. Ras, that prefix has to do with something going apart or diverging. Um, it can also often mean to undo something, right? So if you got dressed later, you can undress, right? Again, the kid or whatever. Razdivat, razdiet, right? Or if you're undressing yourself or if you're being undressed, then we need the particle, right? Razdivat, razdiet, and finally, to change clothing, we get another prefix, pierre, which means across, literally, but it also means re, right? And you can add that to all sorts of verbs. We're going to talk, obviously, a lot more about prefixation, actually a bit more later in this book, and then a lot in book three. Anyway, so pireadjivat, pireadjiet would mean to redress someone else, like the kid, or pireadjivat, pireadjietsa, to redress oneself, or to be redressed, right? Um, okay, so let's just look at a few examples here of, the, of these usages. On nadiel svayechki, he put on his glasses, right? So nadiet, usually, you know, you would need a direct object with that. What did you put on? Okay, mat adiel a sin of rubashku. Mom dressed the son, right, her son, into a shirt. Now there's something you might want to circle. You, you're getting dressed into something in Russian, which makes pretty good sense logically, right? Um, but again, it may be a bit unexpected that we're getting kuda expressions with these items of clothing, right? Here's another example. Ana adielish v jeansy. She dressed herself into jeans, right? Or switching the verb out, ana pireadielis v jeansy. She changed into jeans. She redressed herself into jeans. Okay, a couple more verbs related to clothing. Nasit uh, uh, means to carry, right? As we, I think we've seen that, right? Nasit is just a verb of conveyance, meaning to carry around. And uh, it also means to wear, right? So here's a fun example of just kind of a secondary meaning. I mean, after all, what do we do with clothing? Well, we carry it around all day on our persons, right? So that makes perfect sense. So anyway... Nasit can mean to wear clothing. Nashu, noisish, noisid, right? Shifting stress, e-verb. Finally, what about taking off an item of clothing? That's snimat, snyat, right? So snimaya, snimaya, snimaya. There's a derived imperfective, very easy to conjugate. And snyat is one of the very tricky type with neem is the actual form of the root. And we get snimu, snimish, snimit, etc., right? So take off your hat, right? Uh, means I will take off my hat. Okay, so uh, anyway, you could use some of this vocab today to uh, answer a few questions, right? I'll read through these quickly. What do you usually wear? What kind of clothing do you have? What do you wear to classes? Uh, well, I guess pajamas would be the answer right now, right? Where, with everyone zooming or whatever. Anyway, what about to the gym, right? What do you wear to the gym? Sorry, I missed the question. Do we need to dress warmly in winter, where we live, right? Wherever that is. right? What about in Russia? Do you have to dress warmly in winter? How many times per day do you normally change clothes? Uh, okay, again, look at the literal meaning of the Russian here. Into what would they normally dress you when you were little, right? A divadi, we're getting that third plural uh, construction, right? Uh, 
which could often translate into English as a passive, right? What were you normally dressed in when you were little? Or, you know, again, you could also say, what did they, what did they dress you in when you were a little baby or whatever? Uh, and again, they're, you're, they're dressing you, right? So we're getting the form without the reflexive particle. Ты любишь модно одеваться, или тебе все равно? Do you like to dress fashionably? Модно, right? That is in accordance with moda, with the fashion. Или тебе все равно? Or is it all the same to you? Do you not give a damn, right? Тебе все равно. Всем, надо снимать обувь, когда ты в гостях у русских. Right? You need to take off your uh, footwear, обувь, when you're visiting Russians. Да, right? The answer to that is definitely yes. Надо снимать обувь и одевать, uh, sorry, надевать тапочки. You need to put on your uh, slippers, your тапки or your тапочки. Надо надевать тапочки. Восемь. Во что переодеваешься перед сном, right? What do people, or again, literally, into what do people change before sleep, right? What do they put on before sleep? Okay, that's it for today. Tomorrow we'll learn the genitive plural, which is a rather tricky topic. And uh, keep in mind that the remaining case endings after the genitive plural will be relatively easy. Um, so anyway, until tomorrow, до свидания, товарищи, вперед к новым победам.